Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Catalano. Um, I practice in the Bay Area up in Marin County. I'm a general dentist. Um, I've focused my career on cosmetic dentistry, mostly complex uh, case rehabilitations, smile makeovers. Um, I was lucky to have a mentorship and associateship with Dr. David Hornbrook, who was kind of a pioneer in hands-on cosmetic dental education. So as an associate with him, I learned a ton and then I ended up traveling with him uh, and teaching with him. And so I, um, yeah, I been in the world of complex dentistry. Um, and in that journey, I um, have worked with, with you know, in, in working with complex cases, I've run into TMJ issues. So that has been a rabbit hole for me to look at the TMJ and to treat it from a more, a more of a Pinky Dawson kind of traditional CR uh, approach. And about, I, it was almost maybe 15 years ago, um, I called my friend Ray Kiefer, who I was a dental school classmate of, and then he eventually became an orthodontist. And I asked him about when he treats um, orthodontic patients with TMJ. Does he do it before or after? And he said, well, I send all of my patients to Laura Walls. And I said, whoa, what does she do? And so I ended up, uh, you know, because I, coming from my background, I'm like expecting splint therapy, you know, uh, more of like a, a hard tissue approach to managing the TMJ. And so Ray was going on a totally different uh a track. And so in talking with Laura, I learned more about the tongue than I ever thought I would know. And it, it, it created this passion in me to do a deep dive in this world and to find out more about it. And it was so eye opening. Um, and she has such a gift and she's so knowledgeable in this world. And I want her to like talk to everybody in dentistry because it's so amazing. <laughs> and it is definitely a paradigm shift for any of you that are um, you know, seeing patients that have TMJ issues and wondering, you know, what is etiology, what's causing it, um, how to treat it. Um, and it's, it's a different approach, but it's the, actually the, the, I think in dentistry with the slint therapy, the occlusion issues, I think we put band-aids on the TMJ. As a general dentist, I'll be here to kind of like maybe help with uh, kind of um, helping to translate anything that is <laughs> more difficult for our world to understand with what you're talking about, because it is a whole different skill set of knowledge. So anyhow, I'm really yeah, happy to be here. Chris. Yeah, that's awesome. I really appreciate you. You're an awesome dentist and I love working with you because you're so honest. And uh, I got into this space. I'm a speech language pathologist. I got into the dental space probably 17 years ago because of Dr. Kiefer and I was treating his daughter for swallowing disorder and um, he wanted to know how I changed his daughter's occlusion and that's how this whole thing started and that I didn't know what occlusion was but uh, after finding about the dental space I treated his wife as my first TMD patient and so um, I got into this and it's just been really effective I have a very successful practice in Carlsbad, California. We see about 17,000 patients a year, and I have about 14 therapists here. So identifying TMD, there's so many. It's the only diagnosis without an etiology, according to medicine. And so what I mean by etiology is nobody really knows the cause. What is it genetic? Is it, uh, is it an accident? Is it damage to the joint because of malocclusions, all yes, all of them yes. And so anything TMD related, everybody calls it TMD, TMJ, TMJD, whatever it is, anything to do with a disorder of the temporal mandibular joint refers to a condition that affects the joint and the associated muscles. That's where you're getting the pain. And so it can be structural arthritis. It can be um, because of an accident, it can be genetic, it can be because of stress. And really interesting, lately, it can be because of airway. And so what you want to look at are the conditions that that are related to the TMJ, uh, pain or discomfort or tension. 
and you want to start looking at airway issues, which a lot of you dentists are already doing. And they're associated with swallowing disorder, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, autoimmune, hormone issues, uh, poor dietary intake, posture, and stress. And why I'm saying this is I think it's really important to identify these clinical features because you're going to start seeing these in your patients after hearing about this. And I'm going to show you how to include it for your clinical flow and starting a conversation. And so in the literature, you'll read about oral facial pain and clicking and popping of the joint and abnormal joint function. It's kind of sliding maybe, or it's zigzagging when the person opens the jaw or they can't open it, which is trismus or locked jaw. And, or they chew really funny or they can't keep their lips closed. Bruxism, grinding, headaches and migraines. There's so many clinical features associated with TMJ. And I think that's probably why it's so overwhelming. It's like, where the heck do I start with treating this? And so when I jumped into this, mainly people treated it by isolating the joint by putting a splint in. And so what that does is when you isolate a muscle like that, it'll calm it down for a second. But as soon as it's out and you start function, that's when the pain starts again. And so people become really reliant on these splints which could impact the, the gums, it could impact the teeth, and it also impacts the airway. And so your patients might say these kind of things, and you've probably heard this so many times before, that I have pain or tender, tenderness, it could be one side or, the, or both, difficulty opening their mouth, um, my jaw locks, so if the, you're going to do a cleaning, I can't open my jaw for long, because it will just lock or it feels like my face or the side of my head is aching or my ear. They avoid foods. Um, they might, they might um, be chipping their teeth over and over and over again. And so you keep treating the same tooth for chipping or wearing of the teeth. And a lot of these jaw patients are associated with sinus pressures and nasal stuffiness. And that's something I want to talk to you. I'll talk to you a little bit more uh, as we move along. And then of course, headaches and migraines. And if I'm losing any of you, we're going to ask questions, leave time for questions at the end. And so feel free to type your questions in and uh, Dr. Catalato and Dr. Kiefer and myself will answer them for you. So one of the things that we do with our local dentists and dentists who are on our health platform, we say, just add this to your intake form so you can start a conversation with your patient. And so instead of some doctors want to go ahead and just type these into their, their health intake form. And some doctors literally just copy this sheet and put it in their intake form. So it starts the patient thinking, you know, is it hard to open your mouth or does your jaw get stuck when you're closing or opening your mouth? Maybe you get tired when you eat, talk or sing in the jaw area or you get a headache. Does it click or pop? So once they start answering these questions, when they walk into your office, or if you have them do it online, they start thinking about this. And then your dental hygienist or your intake coordinator can see, oh, wow, there's at least 50% of these are yes, 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 yes. And so they can start the conversation to say, clearly there's jaw position issues and what is this associated with? And that's what this is for you guys. And then what we do that's different, but a lot of functional dentists are getting into this space. I was just on a call right before I picked up this call and talking to them about how to assess a patient for TMD. And so how we do it different is really looking at the posture of the patient. And so we look to see, is the patient's head forward? Is it tilted? Is it torqued? Because when you're working in the mouth, this is going to matter where the jaws sit. So we always look for forward head posture. And why is this important? Who cares, right? So if forward head posture will probably result in an open mouth, which stunts jaw growth, it causes pain and dysfunction. Forward head posture is associated with weak exhalation. So when you're breathing, you take a big breath in, but you can't get a big breath out, which is poor for gas exchanges which results in tightening of the muscles, clenching and grinding of the teeth. Forward head, head posture increases the distance from the chin to the sternum here. And so you go like this. 
And what happens then is the mandible goes back and down, resulting in mouth breathing. And if you haven't already, you probably read books on mouth breathing and sleep taping, and I'll talk about that after as well. But our goal is to keep the lips closed so we can keep the tongue on the roof of the mouth for optimal posture and dissociation of the jaw, lips, and tongue so that we don't have these kind of functions making, clicking, popping, grinding. That's why <laughs> posture is so important. And then sleeping on your side or stomach puts the most pressure on the joint compared to sleeping on your back. But everybody says you have to sleep on your side for sleep because you want optimal breathing. But if you sleep on your side, it hurts your jaw. So what do you do? And so I want you guys to try to see how to establish a neutral spine with the head back. So instead of pulling your head back from the neck, try taking your arms, putting your hands up like this, and then squeezing together a quarter in your scapula, in, the back, in your back, and your shoulder blades, and put it together, and then put your hands down, and that will put your head in a perfect position over your cervical spine. So that puts you in a neutral posture. You can have your patients do that too before uh, you're doing measurements to see if there's a difference. It's, a, it's cool to do. It also allows for the lips to close much more easily and breathe through the nose. And you guys, you guys can play can around you, with that. Can you give me that? Yeah. Can you Tell do me. that again? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So like the head, the ideal head posture is hands yeah, so, in the back. So the ideal head posture the, is that your earlobes are over your shoulders. And so what people do is to fix their posture because they typically come like this up. But what that does is it makes yeah. a curve in the back backwards and it hurts. And so then people go back to that. I see. So instead, go instead, sit up, pull your shoulder blades together and then tuck your chin and try to open your mouth. And then try to jut your jaw, jaw forward and try to open your mouth and feel the difference of how hard it is to open the jaw with the different postures of the cervical spine. Right. Can you feel the difference? Yes, yeah, I often tell my patients, I, I often tell my patients the dental rest position is, you know, lips together, teeth separated, tongue is lifted, breathing through our nose. Yeah. But I never really focus head position for them because I do know a lot of TMJ people, a lot of countries do have that head yeah. tilt. Forward. Yeah. And so when you tilt your head, if you think about that, even if you pull it sideways, close your lips and feel how the muscles tighter on one side versus the other. And if you have a tight muscle and an open muscle, both of those muscles are still weak. And so with weak muscles, what we do to compensate is we clench. Hmm. We also clench to get our airway more open by clenching the muscles together if our head is forward because it opens up the airway. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, I thought, Laura, that uh, most people clench mostly at night when they're sleeping, but I do come across people that clench during the day as well. So yeah, that's, and that's so a good tool to, to look at and talk to them about. Hi, Dr. Keeper. Uh, yeah, so that, that is good. And so when, um, when you're assessing your patient, have them try because self-assessment is the first place of changing a behavior. If the patient doesn't realize what they're doing and what their muscles are doing, it's really hard to make changes in their behavior. Right. Uh, going to the next one. So assessing breathing is the whole new hot topic now. Everybody knows we, like Chris, you, uh, Dr. Cavallotti, you just said, we have to breathe through our nose. We put the lips together, tongues up on the roof. Um, but we have to remember too, when you have somebody with jaw pain or TMJ or TMD, um, that they probably have an airway issue as well. Because yeah. like you just said, Dr. Kiefer, Clenching opens the airway and it's done during sleep, but it's also done during the day. And so when you're looking at sleep and jaw pain, you're going to know that those two are related, if that makes sense. 
And we'll get more into that. That's our yeah. third. We'll get more into the sleep part of it and how that makes sense on our third class. But when the jaws are misaligned yeah. sideways, it can block the airway because it's pulling all the tissue in one direction, the other forward or back. So Ray, when you, cause you're ortho, Dr. Kiefer, you're ortho. What have you noticed with airway with people with different types of occlusions? Um, if there's a, a deep bite, there's often a constriction of the pharynx because the, the lower jaw is forced back. Um, in general, class three, growers, the underbites have a pretty open pharynx, but their maxilla is underdeveloped. So that still impacts tongue posture. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think people tend to have more issues with uh, upper airway resistance syndrome with class three. Uh, class one depends on the severity of uh, the, um, how much uh, width they have formed. And uh, class one, two, even though orthodontically the teeth are matched up appropriately, both jaws can be retrusive in their growth and development. Yeah, especially. So they can uh, still have an airway issue. Yeah, it's amazing. In the past couple of years, really the past year, I guess, the impact of the airway on the teeth and the growth and the gum health and the teeth, the tooth health. Is, ama is amazing the impact that we've been seeing. It's so cool. Mm, um, yeah. that how just changing yeah. that can change everything about inside the mouth. Yeah. Okay, the it's earlier you address it, the better. Yeah. And so it's super important from our assessment perspective and what you're doing as dentists to make to see if the person is a mouth breather or nose breather. And what do you observe? And we we were gonna put that picture, Ray of Tom uh, Dr. Kiefer of Tom Cruise in there because he was a mouth breather and uh, saying, you know, looking through to see how that changed over time. He's definitely had a lot of dental work done, cosmetic and ortho and is breathing through his nose. And uh, it was kind of cool to see, but uh, being able to assess before you go to ENT, see if the patient is breathing through their mouth, through their mouth as a habit, or they are unable to breathe, incapable of breathing through their nose. And by doing that, when you sit them in the chair and just give them a little Dixie cup of water and have them hold it in their mouth while you're prepping the patient, your hygienist can do this. Uh, if they can hold it in for three minutes, typically what it means is the nostrils are open enough to be able to access nasal breathing. And that's pretty safe to say, okay, fine, you could recommend uh, sleep taping at night when a person could do that for three minutes. Chris, have you heard about that? No, but I'm like that because I remember Ray had told me about, because I, you know, after the James Nestor book came out, um, yeah. we were talking more about it with patients about lip taping. And then Ray had kind of cautioned me that, you know, there has been some issues around it. So it's nice to have like, hey, before you do that, see if you can do this first. Yeah, it's cool. If you don't have a peak nasal inspiratory flow meter that you're testing, actual flow of, of air yeah. going through the nose, the three minute test does the trick. And James Nestor is actually making a, a at take home capnometer with uh, Roger Price in Australia right now because of what happened when over sleep taping, people are sleep taping with CPAP and it's causing airway issues and gas exchange issues. And so to kind of make up to say, everybody should sleep tape. Okay. We have to be smart about saying, okay, but can you breathe first, right? Hey, Laura, can you just talk a little bit more about the right. PNIF? Right. The PNIF? Yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, the PNIF, a peak, can you grab me one actually? Uh, the PNIF, it, it's called a peak nasal inspiratory flow meter. It's super easy to use. And I really think that every dentist Every doctor's office, every dentist should have one because it will tell you if a person can actually is capable of breathing through their nose and how. And we've learned over the past year for sleep taping, we don't recommend sleep taping prior to them hitting 100 units of flow. And this is what it looks like. Thanks. So it looks like this. They're about 80 bucks. 
Um, and it's just a mask. And here's the meter and you put it on. And so to test the person, what you do is you put it over their face like this and just go like that. And that's it. And I'm, I'm at about 220, Ray. <laughs> and uh, so the goal is for them to get over 100 and then it would be safe to sleep tape. So anything in this area where it is viable to say, okay, it's safe. And I like and where, the recommendation. Where do you get the value, uh, the 100 um, value? Is that a, a paper that was written? Oh, th that's that's from what we've had success in the clinic with. And there's a ton of papers written on the peak nasal inspiratory flow meter. Okay. And um, okay. there's also an uh, app, a software associated with this monitor that you can put the patient's number in. And it will spit out a diagnosis of what's happening with the nose called the Daphne, which is really cool. I could, if anybody's interested in the information, I could definitely give it to them. So in, in my opinion, it, it, I think it's a really good idea if you are suggesting lip taping to have some data and some studies behind you. Um, I think it's worth the $80 to purchase that. And there have been isolated cases where um, there was actually a death uh, with lip taping. Uh, it had more to do with the, the child being uh, queasy and sick to their stomach, but um, parent wasn't really smart about dealing with the situation and, and there was aspiration. And so, that, I mean, bad things can certainly happen. Um, that was more of a judgment issue, but having, you know, a, a process as to how you approach it and, and some science behind it, I think is important. I think it's really important and to know how this breathing is affecting the clenching of the teeth. And why are, why are they clenching? Why is there malocclusion? And that's why we're going into this. It's, it's really important. Yeah. And you can also measure, you can do OSATs. OSATs, does, it does not work on darker skin. It's not accurate. And so it can be decreased if you do have darker skin. So it's not a great measurement tool. Also using incentive spirometry. So you could really see, can you take a big breath in the chest? Are you getting good gas exchanges? It's really important. And then we we use rhinomanometry because it talks about nasal resistance in the anterior and then posterior part of the nasal sinus complex. And so it tells us and predicts what's going to happen with sleep and what type of splints and guards to give for TMJ and or sleep. From, from a myofunctional perspective, we also look at the jaw, lips, and tongue and how they move and how they function and what have they done to the teeth to cause the clenching and or the pain in the muscles, ligaments, and tendons. So we always look to see if the jaw is hypermobile. And I know uh, you guys measure the jaw, right, for how it opens. Um, we don't have a, or we don't take a specific measurement, but we'll note deviation on opening and range of motion. Okay. So when you refer to a myofunctional therapist, what they're going to assess is the jaw hypermobile. That means that the muscles are going to need to compensate for that hypermobility that they're not catching. That's going to cause jaw pain. Is there extra bone growth? And we'll show this to you in pictures at the end, um, which typically is associated with airway issues and clenching. So you look at palatal tori, that's at the top of the mouth. And then you look at mandibular Tori, which is at the bottom of the mouth. And then, Ray, do you want to comment on that? Say that one more time. Sorry, I didn't hear. About the tori exostosis. Uh, yes. Um, palatal tori, lingual tori. I've always thought that it's from clenching. And uh, I think that in from what I've heard, uh, the masseter attaches to the lower border of the mandible, the mandible flexes. And uh, when you're flexing bone, it's going to want to build upon itself. So that's why the tori grow in that area. Mm -hmm. it, but there's, I don't think that, I think there's no definitive studies, at least from what I've heard, there's not a, a consensus as to yes, tori are caused from clenching, but I think most people agree. Would you agree, Chris? I think so. I find that it seems to be that the clinchers show that. Yeah. yeah that but it is you know, what I'm always wondering is how like there are um, some similarities with tori development. And I don't know if anybody's ever done like, you know, the midline tori is this person, the lingual tori is this, or the exostosis on the buckle is, is this type, you know, I mean, 
I've yeah. seen, yeah, I, I just know, I just look at it as this person has definitely some clenching issues. But the interesting thing, and, and, um, and Laura, now that you're on there, one thing that I do see common is the lower, the massive cori. A lot of times I'll see a, a, a tongue, the, the lingual freedom is attached really kind of high up on the, the, the lingual gingival uh, level. It's almost consistent every time. Oh, oh, that's that's super it's interesting. Like, um, yeah, that's a that's really, really high attachment. Yeah. Yeah. The, where I, 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 I see it so I common. Like, oh, okay, that's really cool. It would be neat to see if the other dentists are seeing the same thing. I mean, it's a great opportunity for a study, really. Yeah. You know. Um. So yeah. we're looking. We want to make sure we're looking to see if that's there because it's a sign of clenching and jaw, uh, jaw not yeah. moving in the correct pattern. And we want to see is are the lips open or closed. We want to see is the mentalis tight because it is. It typically means that this is moving and the jaw is down and retracted. So it's having to work extra hard to close the lips. Chap lips typically mean the mouth is open and they're a mouth breather. So then you're going to have jaw associated issues with that. And then look where the tongue is. Does it rest on the roof of the mouth? Is it scalloped along the edges because it's pushing against the teeth, which causes a lot of tension in the medial pterygoid and the masseter muscles? And then you look at the cheeks. Are they puffy? Do they have the linea alba going down the center? That typically means they have a tongue thrust going like this and sucking the cheeks in, which push the teeth in, which causes clenching and also tightness in the lateral pterygoids. And so a quick way to check uh, this would be if you have a patient while they're holding the water in their mouth for the three minute check to see if they nose breathe, see if they can sip, smile and swallow without the water dripping out or without the tongue thrusting. And then you could see how this is all working together. It's easy to do. Um, from, from a myofunctional perspective of the treatment, how, what do we do about it? So, um, we use, we use our MouthWorks program app. We have in practice treatment rooms that we address all the different occlusions and TMD, TMD tonight is our focus. focus on no. um, um, hi. Hi. um, and we have two. Th of appliances called the oral placement appliance. And this helps with correct tongue posture, releasing the masseters and then protecting the teeth when people are on a computer or sleeping at night. And so oral myo treatment, we're calling it for TMJ or TMD or TMJD is the whole thing is reveal to your patient that you have options to treat. So it's not only a splint. So we don't wanna only isolate the muscles and let them rest. We do for some time. And then we want to find out what's happening and how do we help them. So for clenchers and grinders, we use the oral placement appliance pretty quick in the game because we want to take the tongue away from the floor of the mandible. And so that device that we have will put the tongue up on the roof of the mouth. And then we use the exercises to reduce the habits that are causing the jaw pain and tension. And so there's there's pain cream that we have also available and we refer to chiropractors also in the area. Um, if we have a cervical spine issue where we can't correct the torsion and get a neutral spine. So those are all treatment options. And then um, when you're looking when just quickly, because I know Dennis time is a hard thing because you're selling time and you got to go quick and you have a lot of patients. And so some quick tips, how you would look at it without doing measurements is. When you go in with your tool, is the jaw opening smoothly or does it slide over or does it kind of hinge and click, click? That's something you go, okay, that's not typical. It's not a smooth opening. There's a jaw issue or instability from each side. And then when they do open the mouth, look where the tongue is. Is it big in their mouth? Is it retracted in their mouth? Is it long and narrow? because it will show you then that it's not working effectively, which is causing the jaw to overcompensate. You can hear clicking or popping when you're opening. You can see quickly, okay, here's three fingers, put it in. All you guys, I, I think most dentists I talked to said they've heard that before. That's typically within normal limits of an opening if, you can, if they can open for three fingers. 
Um, ask them if they start getting pain when you're doing your dental work. And then you're looking for the symmetry of the jaw. Do you see one masseter that's really big and one that's really small? Uh, then you can see that one side's being overused. So all of these things clinically can be done probably in less than a minute. Laura, can you talk about scalloping as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So scalloping of the tongue is, I think, Chris, did we talk about this where, where the tongue pushes against the teeth and it causes a scalloped edge? And so you can see the indentation of the, of the teeth on the tongue. And basically what that's doing is it's opening the airway in the back. But the consequence of that, when you're pushing your tongue against the teeth like that, you guys can try it right now, push. And then what it does is it over engages the masseter and then medial pterygoid, which is under the mandible. And so when people wake up in the morning, that's often the, the reason why, oh, my jaw's killing me in the morning. It hurts so bad. And they open their tongue and they have a huge scallop edge with linea alba on the side. And that's what that is. Does that make sense? Yep. I think that's always a good one to look for. And it's pretty obvious. It's so, yeah, I should have put some pictures in here. I could, uh, I ha have some on my website that people can check this out. Is, you know, can I Laura, this is exactly where, so in dentistry, we look at TMJ pain as a result of clenching. So we're looking at clenching muscles. We don't think outside the box of like the tongue, which we never learned anything about. There's no, and so this is where I learned a lot from you is, and, and I'm hoping that, um, the, uh, that this is getting across is that the tongue is playing a vital role in these TMJ people. Mm -hmm. So the, the tongue dysfunction, if, if it operates, I remember you explained it. If a tongue is operating correctly, you don't have TMJ pain. It's a very passive, very simple, relaxed system if it's working properly. The person that has these tongue dysfunction, tongue issues, they're overworking so many muscles by having this dysfunctional tongue and their mouths are moving extra. I mean, everything, all their muscles are really overactive. And that's what leads to a lot of TMJ pain. And we've, yeah. It's never, at least on my radar, I've been doing dentistry for 32 years. It was never part of the discussion. It was mostly clenching, pterygoids, masseter, clenching, maybe they're off, you know, but it was never <laughs> like, oh, well, the tongue is a massive engagement tool. Yeah. Uh, and so understanding that, I think, is, gives us a bigger picture of what's going on. And then it ties in the airway. It just ties in everything. So I really, really think this is, even though it's subtle, that, scalp, that was a massive point for at least for dentistry at least for me because i again i'm coming from splint therapy cr clenching you know balance bite clenching stop the clenching use an anterior deep programmer you know it's just all these very <laughs> mechanical approaches to yeah. dealing with something that why is it all happening so this is yeah. this is really cool yeah. yeah, and I, I think that's so that it's so wonderful that you say, okay, now I know what I'm looking at and can I do it quickly? And I think, you know, 15 years ago, I was so excited I would be analyzing everybody's tongue and the tongue map, all the things. And now it could be so quick. And a dentist can do the same thing very quickly. Yeah. So if you know, okay, you might yeah. use some of the ways that you learned, you know, splint therapy, you could do all of the things you just mentioned. But then yeah. it doesn't go to the root cause of why is the jaw hurting? Right. Right. A, a exactly. really cool way, a way for a, a quick way to switch it to is taking the ears and putting your finger in the ear and pulling, twisting the ear forward with the tongue on the roof of the mouth and then back um, after, after uh, you do a cleaning. And that really resets the temporal mandibular joint. And so then they walk, your patient walks out without mm. the tension of having the mouth open for a long time. Does Can you say sense? that one more time? Yeah, for sure. So take your thumbs and then put it inside your ear like this, and then pinch the top of the ear and twist it forward while you maintain, hold the tongue on the roof of the mouth here and twist forward and then hold it for about three seconds, breathe in. And then take it and then twist backwards three seconds and then let it go. It releases the tension on the temporal mandibular joint right there at the anterior ramus. And it's mm. fast and effective. And just doing that extra little 
you know, five seconds for a patient or 10 seconds for a patient makes the whole experience so much better, you know? And so you're going in with, you know, smarts already, but then they're leaving with a really good experience. And then they can see like, oh yeah, my jaw felt better when you did that ear thing to me. Well, you <laughs> know then that this temporalis muscle is super tight and that's from clenching and from the tongue not working effectively and probably an airway issue. So it's you. there's really quick, fast ways to release it. And there's also really quick, fast ways clinically to assess it, if that makes sense. Making sense? Am I making sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we, we talked about this already before. I What causes it? Iatrogenic accidents, all of the things. And I think people want to always tell their story, but also then saying, I get it. I hear what you're saying. I want to look at the function and what's happening with your jaw, lips, and tongue, your posture and your breathing so that I can help eliminate some of the habits causing the jaw pain. And that's a really impactful way to help treat your patients. So uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with myofunctional therapy. I'm going to just call it myofunctional therapy. There's all kinds of different things to call it, but um, there's myofunctional therapy works because we're re-educating muscle function. And the four levels of how this works is we assess the patient and we have them assess themselves. And so with that, then we go ahead and say, okay, can you feel how your jaw is off? And so first it's self-assessment. And um, there's a bunch of, there are a bunch of, uh, there's a bunch of information in the National Institute of Health and also the National Library of Medicine that show how all of these impact a person's jaw. Just, I just put them on there so people have that. Um, clear tray aligners, because dentists are using those a lot now too. And um, Ray and Chris, you guys can comment more on this. From, from what I get often with the clear tray aligner patients that turn into TMJ problems is because they have a tongue issue and a clenching issue, it's exacerbated by having the clear trays in. And so then they end up coming to me to say, okay, we need this habit addressed and fixed. But what are the perspectives from you guys? Uh, I definitely see people clench more when there's some plastic yeah. in between their teeth. Okay. Yeah. Chris, do you and I, I will say since I, I mostly expand, I mean, everybody I'm expanding, I don't do IPR. I'm not fighting. I'm I'm trying to create room for the tongue. What's interesting is I usually get a really positive response from a lot of patients once they begin. I'm like I'm not going against a nature. I think the early orthodontic and even Invisalign advocates a lot of times is a retractive style orthodontics where you're fighting mother nature. Um, you know the, the tongue and I and I find that when I expand, I just expand everybody. Um, I usually see, I see comfort. I mean, once in a while I'll have someone that definitely triggers the extra plastic for sure in mm -hmm. between their teeth they're clenching more. Um, but I don't know. I, I'm real. I do not follow a lot of Invisalign's guidance on IPR retraction of things. I mean, I, yeah, I'm really <laughs> just opening things up. So I don't see as much, I go, it's much faster treatment. Mm -hmm. um it's it's uh simplified but i'm i'm really just kind of uh a more of a passive expanding kind of style um and i don't see as much i th think when i first did it i followed their recipes of like pulling everything back and tightening things yeah. and it was yeah. like patients were struggling oh my gosh yeah, we're like, yeah i agree it, it, it's I beneficial i never use elastics with their recommendations ever um, I, I never do any of that type of work that's going to make it even worse for the patient. It's like a very passive expansion model that I use, idealizing two positions and leveling and yeah. Yeah. In general, if you can make more room so, for the tongue, it's better. Yeah, definitely. That's for sure. Yeah. 
and yeah, and getting that and uh, pairing that with correct tongue posture is a great way to go when it's starting to open space because it, it helps open the space wider and faster. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Kiefer and I have had a bunch of cases where they will show you one coming up here. Um, it's coming up right here. Here's one of our cases that we just finished yesterday. <laughs> Uh, so she's a really cool case. Ray, do you want to give the kind of the history teeth wise, and then we could talk about what she did? Okay. So, um, did, I also had sent some, uh, I, I have a lot of, uh, a couple of TMJ specialists refer me people after they get them out of pain. So she was treated prior with a lower orthotic and a nighttime sleep device. Um, and uh, what the, the objective is, is with the lower orthotic, uh, the docs will posture the jaw forward to decompress the joint and to open up the airway. And then the nighttime appliance is to keep the airway open at night by a, a mandibular advancement device that holds the, the jaw open or the forward. So it holds the uh, pharyngeal space open. Mm -hmm. So it is very typical when I see them, they have a posterior open bite because they're wearing the splint all the time. And when they take it out, they just occlude on their anterior teeth. <clears throat> Generally, they're in much better, uh, they're feeling a lot better uh, as far as the TMJ symptoms are concerned, you know, typically headaches, popping, clicking, locking, um, those sorts of things. Um, and uh, so... I transition them out of the, the orthotic. I try to increase the vertical to close the posterior open bite. As it, as you can see, the upper I've expanded a bit, um, and the lower I've expanded it a bit. Um, this person did a lot of extra work in that she got the mandibular tori removed to improve tongue space. I believe she got a labial phrenectomy, and she also got a lingual phrenectomy. Yeah. Um, and then, in, in for me, the key, luckily, Laura works close to me. Um, so when I have TMJ people, I send them to Laura to take care of the soft tissue issues with the tongue and the clenching and the nose breathing and, and all those important things. So right. this was a very successful case because we were both able, I mean, basically, all I did was I changed the structure and Laura worked to change the the poor function. So, and and gen this generally works throughout the whole body. If there's poor function, then there's going to be dysfunctional structure. Right. It, yeah, and she was such a she's such a cool case because she was so compliant and she did the job. You know, she did the work that she needed to do. But um, her history is autoimmune disease, um, severe depression. She was on three medications um, for anxiety and depression prior to starting this treatment. She had sleep issues. So she'd go to bed about three at night because she couldn't go to sleep um, and then wake frequently throughout the night. She had head and neck pain where she was going to a chiropractor twice a week um, at the time. And um, she wasn't getting any changes. She had been in, Ray, wasn't she in braces before? I think once or twice. I, I believe she was. Yeah, she, she um, for sure she had a labial phrenectomy, which uh, the reason I address the labial phrenectomy is because it, it decreases or tends, if it's ex, uh, excessive, it'll tend to reduce uh, the mobility of the upper lip. Um, so part of what I'm trying to do is get the upper teeth to come forward to fix so the... She had actually, I just, I'm looking, she had a labial phrenectomy, buccal tie phrenectomy, and then she had the lingual phrenectomy. And that's interesting, Chris, because you see how anterior that frenum is attaching there to the mandible, like you were saying. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's exactly what I see. Right. That's exactly right. And um, yeah, so from this, yeah. And so from this, she has a reverse swallow. You can tell if one tooth is going backwards and one tooth is going forward. That's typically indicative of a reverse swallow pattern. And so she had the lingual phrenectomy. You can see here, her tongue was pulled all the way back. 
And you can see here, it's more relaxed and not in the back. Her melon potty here was a four. Her melon potty here is a one. And so she's now, uh, she is now not taking medications and she uh, got a job and she is um, going to sleep and staying. Is, better. It takes about 45 minutes now to go to sleep, but she's going to bed by 1130. She's a night owl. But so much better. She's so happy. It's it's uh, it looks awesome. Wow. And this yeah, is and as it up. as it relates to the anxiety and depression, yeah, um, the sleep cycle. If they're not getting enough uh, REM sleep, then that's going to have a, a tendency to impact uh, anxiety and depression. Yeah, so it, improving the sleep yeah. quality is, yeah. is huge for. It's huge. It's such a, uh, we did nasal release technique on her as well as Mayo and um, her outcomes are awesome. She got out of braces also, was it eight months early? Um, yeah, months? I believe it was eight, yeah. It, okay. it treated out a lot faster than okay. I anticipated. Yeah, that's so awesome. So here you guys can see uh, how her, the bite, the depth of her bite improved. Her airway is so much better. Her head posture is further back her chin's not so forward as here and here she kind of had a tilt going off to this way and she just looks so good overall she's really pleased with the outcome the second case is a um 17 year old we did um she had already had braces and um she was scheduled for jaw surgery and then went to dr Kiefer. and then ray do you want to talk about this case uh she had uh, i don't think you were doing the ballooning back then mm -mm. um so i i think that the developmentally the genesis of the problem was the fact that she couldn't breathe well through her nose she couldn't i don't think breathe at all through her nose so on um the left side of the screen uh if you look at her palate the palate has changed as far as the well it, it is expanded but also the high palatal vault if you see a, a shadow cast on the palate then that's an indication that the tongue is not really up on the roof of the mouth at all. If you see an open bite like she has, like she presented with, that's from the tongue. Every time she swallows, the tongue's pressing into that Area. open space there, so the teeth never get the opportunity to uh, close down. Yeah. Um, I think it would have treated out better uh, with ballooning. I think she still has difficulty breathing through her nose, but I believe she tapes though now, right? Um, she mouth tapes now her, she came in, she measured on the PNIF, she was 50. And then we did her, we did a sinus routine with her with, uh, um, saline spray and X clear the grapefruit one. Um, so we got her up to 110, but she's coming in the summer for the ballooning, but her, she's solid right now on her teeth where, where she's holding, she's done the work. Yeah. And then the myofunctional therapy was critical for her. Yeah, definitely critical. And she wears an oral place and appliance as well at night with alternating trays. Um, super good case. She's in college now doing awesome. No more jaw pain. Her jaw pain was debilitating and headaches. And then this young lady, this is an example of she had sleep issues and a deep bite. And you can talk about her um, teeth, Ray. Uh, it's one of those cases where the, the mandible is, it, you, the deep bite, that's where the mandible gets kind of trapped backwards and, and it uh, can collapse the, the pharyngeal space. Uh, and if the, the posterior teeth were really tipped towards the, the middle, the lingually, um, so it was just a, and it affected the bite. So she had a bit of a, a what I call a functional shift where the lower jaw has to be retracted in order to function appropriately with the posterior teeth. Um, so uh, again, I just expanded, uh, worked on opening up the bite, intruded the lower anterior teeth, uh, and uh, her jaw came forward. Um, the jaw will come forward typically if the dysfunction of the muscles is, is addressed and they learn how to breathe better through their nose. In the original photos, you can see how her lips are parted in yeah, some right. of the pictures. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whenever the lips are parted, that's a sign that they're, they they need to breathe through their mouth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she did myo for 16 sessions. At this time, we weren't doing nasal ballooning or even measuring for uh, uh, nasal respiration. 
And um, you can see here how her head is torqued. She's mouth breathing here. Um, definitely a deep bite and clenching, especially on the right side. And you can see that shift of the head going over to the right side. And so her oral dysfunction, she was heavily using these left muscles and the right muscles were really weak in her, in her profile at the beginning. And you can see how her tongue's kind of twirling up to the top, but in the back was completely occluding the airway. And then the side by side, how you can see the perimeter of the tongue now has a really nice shape and was staying up on the roof of the mouth. And for her here, um, she was so heavily clenching. She had non-dissociative uh, ability to chew. And so she would swallow things whole or use a cup to two cups of water per meal because she wasn't chewing appropriately. And so that changed a lot too and helped with her growth and her mood and, and everything. So she did a great job. She was only 16 sessions of myo and no surgery. So that's the, that is the end of our, um, that is the end of our slideshow. If Mary, do we have any questions? I didn't see any come through, but I have a question. I have a couple of questions actually um, for Dr. Kiefer and Dr. Catalano. Um, in terms of getting started in the practice, most of the doctors on here, I, I'm assuming are not doing myofunctional in their office right now. And so um, getting started, what, what advice would you give to them to kind of get started and um, how might their schedule change? Um, do they need to have a medical biller? Um, or is it dental build? Um, and, and those are some of the questions that we've gotten from some of our evaluators of the program. So I was just curious how you got started and what you what advice you might give to them. So um, I the first thing I did was I got on the app and I'm in the middle of doing it. I always like to try things out before I make it available to my clientele. Um, I'm always talking about, I, I think part of it is learning as much as you can about it first. So when people have questions, you're capable of answering like, why, should, why do I need to do this? You know, so you, get, you need to know, you know, have a, a good answer to any potential questions that, that they might have, you know, it, 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 it can help your TMJ. You know, there's, there's a number of really valid questions if, if they're good at, about, um, doing the exercises. Uh, as far as making it uh, available, I think Laura does have a couple of different plans that you can use. Um, I'm going on the one where I'm going to have her company monitor it. Um, but there's the option of actually hiring a myofunctional therapist to manage it for you. Um, but uh, I think gather up all the information that you can to, to um, find out what would be involved to implementing it. And I think Laura's um, um, office can help you with that. And then see if it, if you can make it work in your office. What would you say, Chris? Yeah, I agree. I think finding out, the first step is really learning about this world as much as you can um, and understanding what you're seeing in your patients and looking at things differently than maybe what you've been taught and look at the tongue as as a player in in our world of, of facial development tmj it it plays a really big part and it's so sad that it was never really discussed um but i i agree with ray like learning a, a lot about it and then i'm lucky i do have a couple um malfunctional therapists in close to my area they're not nearly as talented as laura i mean i but they are, they're definitely, they're learning. And I mean, I think, sh you know, courses like this will help because they can, um, you know, listen in and learn new skills. Um, but um, I don't have one that comes to my office. I, um, I generally just kind of refer out. And I think the app, app is also, I'm just starting with it. Um, it's such a valuable tool. So if you're in an area where you don't have access to a malfunctional therapist, um, you know that it, it's kind of a cool tool because it's like hey laura's in my app <laughs> <laughs> and it also as, as far as 
the education of, of learning this. There's some really good books, uh, Why We Sleep, Breath. Um, yeah. Uh, what's What are some of the others, Chris? Yeah, I mean, I can't emphasize enough of Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. He's got a uh, podcast also, um, the Matt, the Matt Walker podcast, and he goes over uh, a sleep in, in each, uh, in, the, in the podcast, he goes over all the different categories, but really understanding the importance of sleep, because that's the other thing too, is I think we just look at sleep as like, oh, we close our eyes and we wake up and we're done, but it's such a sophisticated machine that is happening with our brain and it's so vital and medicine isn't really aware of it and dentistry isn't aware of it. We're, I think dentistry has is, is got a leg up on physicians because we're seeing it more in our, we're, we're able to identify sleep issues, but um, he, address, he just um, stresses the importance of sleep and at the different levels and, and what can happen if you interrupt these levels um, in relation to a lot of what Laura's talking about with, with airway issues and how you get more fragmented sleep. You may not be in, in some of the deeper layers as much, um, I am now for all of my clenching TMJ patients, I am recommending a sleep study. Absolutely. Um, and I'm, they're all coming back with sleep issues. I haven't had anybody saying, Oh, I sleep great. It's like the opposite. And I had one individual who I regret to this day that I didn't do it on earlier, but he was, he's a prominent physical therapist in our town, massive TMJ issues, clenching. I did everything I could for him. Splints. I did my T scan and balance his occlusion. I did everything, and he just managed it with just splint therapy and things like that. Well, fast forward ten years after, you know, he's in my care. He has a massive heart attack, and um, luckily he survived. He's okay, but they ended up recommending to get a sleep study, and sure enough, he had severe sleep apnea. And I knew he did. I, I mean, I knew subconsciously he did because I know all my TMJ people have sleep stuff, but I never pinned it on him that he might be one. And I look back now, like 10 years ago, I should have said, you know what? You're a clenching, you have TMJ, TMJ issues. Let's get a sleep study because there's something going on with your sleep. And um, maybe it would have avoided the heart attack. I don't know. I mean, I, but I just think that this is something that was never in our uh, radar until now. And I think it's really important for us to really look at these issues seriously. Yeah. I also think for the dentists that are trying to learn myofunctional therapist, therapy, um, understanding the oral facial complex, if you've read that, and it's by, what is her name, Kristen Gatto, I think, Gatto, G-A-T-T-O, and it talks about how posture and breathing and the mouth works together for the outcomes of jaw pain and airway issues and and it's a really nice book to outline kind of the foundation of how this all works. Yeah. Yeah. For and then sure. Laura, one last question for hey, you. Jeff, oh. Jeff. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. That's okay. Um, Laura, my question was, you were mentioning um, sometimes clear aligner therapy can cause some TMD issues. And um, I'm assuming that we might be talking about that next week on our Ooh. crowding webinar. Yeah, on the dental crowding webinar, we'll talk okay. about that more and and uh, some ways to identify if that's happening. Great. And so, yeah, I just wanted to give a shout out to let everybody know that next week we're going to be doing dental crowding, same time, same place. And then um, in two weeks, we'll be doing sleep. Yeah. So if you haven't registered, um, we just let us know. Um, we sent out all three links, but um, we'll be happy to resend those if anyone wants to. Um, just email me, Mary at Dental Advisor, and we'll get you signed up. But I didn't didn't want to go back. So if there is um, there was another comment that I didn't want to cut you off. Oh, Chris, what were you saying? Oh no, no, I was going to say when Ray asked me what other, you know, I think Jeff Rouse at Spear does a yeah. pretty good job in connection with airway and TMJ and sleep. Um, so I think he's another resource. Would you yeah. agree, Ray? Definitely. He was one of the first people yeah. I, I went to, to start to learn about it. Um, and there's another yeah. one, um, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Mark Cruz is another good one. He's on the West coast. Um, but, uh, he does a bit of lecturing 
uh, has a mini residency on airway. Uh, very informative and, and he taught me a lot as well. So there's some residencies out there that don't take up too much of your time and uh, they teach you, they're very complete and, and can teach you a lot about the, the airway connection. Thanks guys.